Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out to another HRG weekly webinar. We're so happy to have you with us. As we continue to navigate through these crazy, unprecedented times, HRG is continually committed to providing industry updates and tips and tricks that you can leverage right away. And our weekly webinar is taking place every Wednesday morning. So make sure to tell your friends and get here with us every week. As usual, before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. To make sure that we honor the 30 minutes that we have allotted today, we will answer any questions that come up in a question and answer sheet that will be sent out later today with the remainder of the webinar resources, including the slides and the webinar recording. This morning, we have HRG coding expert Troy West here with us to discuss best practices for infusion and injection coding and charting. Go ahead and take it away, Troy. All right, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so today we're going to be discussing best practices for infusion and injection coding and charting. Uh, my name is Troy West. I am an HIM coding manager here at Healthcare Resource Group. Um, I've been in the healthcare industry doing billing and coding over the past 17 years. And a previous job I, I had held was for hospitals doing uh, auditing and education on this very topic. Um, so it's definitely something I know that can come up a lot. Uh, this is mostly facility focused in the information that I'm providing. Um, and I'm going to go over a lot of the basics about billing guidelines, hierarchy, you know, hydration and documentation. Um, there's definitely a lot of caveats in this subject, a lot of um, what if scenarios. So I do highly recommend sitting in those questions if you have them after we finish the presentation. Um, but I do hope I'm able to uh, answer any questions that you do have as we go through. Um, and just a quick side note, with the way things are right now, I am still working from home. I have a house full of children and dogs. Um, I hope that the audio quality stays good for you, but I, I do apologize if there are any disturbances going forward, but we should be okay. So to start off with just an overview, CPT defines um, these two terms. So for injection, they describe it as delivers a dosage in one shot rather than over a period of time, and it may be administered by various routes, including subcutaneous, intramuscular, intraarterial, and intravenous. Um, typically, these are drugs that are administered for an immediate effect, um, hoping to take place within three to five minutes. CPT defines infusion as the administration of intravenous fluids and or drugs over a period of time for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. These are usually medications or solutions that are administered by a saline um, with longer term effects. There are different types of medications and service levels for infusions. Um, there is chemotherapy, uh, which includes highly complex drugs and biological agents. Um, there isn't a lot of information in this presentation about chemotherapy administration. It, it does tie in some with um, it definitely goes with the hierarchy and a little bit with hydration, um, but it is kind of its own big beast, so just be aware of that. Um, there's also hydration, which is repackaged fluids or electrolytes. And then the rest are therapeutic, prophylactic, and diagnostic substances that um, are usually just the administration of drugs or substances not used for hydration. Per CPT and CMS, uh, injections are not intended to be reported by a physician in the facility setting. Um, they state when an ENM service and a therapeutic and diagnostic injection service are submitted with CMS place of service codes 19, 21, 22, 23, 24, 26, 51, 52, and 61 for the same patient by the same individual physician or other health qualified healthcare professional on the same date of service. Only the E&M service will be reimbursed and the therapeutic and diagnostic injections are not separately reimbursed regardless of whether a modifier is reported with the injections. For non-facility injection services, um, they state that E&M services are provided in a non-facility setting are considered an inherent component for providing an injection service. That means CBT indicates these services typically require direct supervision for any or all purposes of patient assessment, provision of consent, safety oversight, and intra-service supervision of staff. 
when a diagnostic and therapeutic injection procedure is performed in a place of service other than 19, 21, 22, 23, 24, 26, 51, 52, and 61, and an E&M service is provided on the same date of service by the same individual physician or other qualified healthcare professional, only the appropriate therapeutic and diagnostic injections will be reimbursed, and the E&M service is not separately reimbursed. Um, it is important to keep in mind that with different pairs, there are different rules. Even CPT and CMS ha can have different guidelines. In this presentation, um, we'll present some information from both Noridian and Novitas, but it is important to check with your local Medicare carrier and your commercial payers on their individual guidelines as they may be different from what's presented here. Uh, so, so some billing guidelines. Um, one of the most important ones is there's only one initial service that may be coded per encounter, which is determined by hierarchy. Um, this means that the order of the service delivery does not determine what is initial. It doesn't matter what you did first for the patient. That is not what's going to get the initial. It's going to fall into that hierarchy. We are going to discuss hierarchy here very shortly to go over that. But basically, you would determine over the entire encounter what came what came highest on the hierarchy, and that would get the initial CPT code. Documentation of time is essential. Uh, and start and stop times is the most efficient way if you're looking to get the, the best coding, the most efficient coding, the most accurate coding. Fluids that are used to administer drugs are considered incidental hydration and they would not be payable. Um, it is important to know that infusions and hydrations are coded by the hour. And when it comes to infusions, the first 16 minutes um, so anything greater than 15 minutes are required to bill for that first hour. If it was less than that, you would be having to code it as a IV push. Um, and then for each additional hour, after that whole first hour has passed, you have to have more than 30 minutes past, so 31 or more, um, to bill for that additional hour. IV pushes, uh, they have to have 30 minutes passed between administrations when it's the same drug being given twice. Um, if a separate drug is given, then that time frame does not matter. You can bill for the additional IV push. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're pushing the same drug more than once within 30 minutes, that would be considered only one administration. Moving on to hierarchy, uh, per CMS, again, there is only one initial drug administration per vascular access site and per encounter that should be reported. Um, if an infusion crosses over the date of service, uh, you would still bill with the date of service that it was started with, uh, just because that is still the initial for that encounter. It is CPT that established the current guidelines for the hierarchy um, that we use for injections and infusions. That's where it came from. And it's also really important that you make sure you have a valid medication order that it, when you're doing coding. Um, and also, hierarchy would not apply to physician coding. Again, this is more facility-based, but the hierarchy does not apply to the physician reporting. So on this slide, uh, you're able to see the actual hierarchy. Um, as you can see on the top, uh, it starts with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy uh, rules the, the hierarchy, um, and then it goes into the non-chemotherapy prophylactic or diagnostic services, and then hydration being on the bottom. Um, and then for each category, it goes from infusion to IV push to injection. So again, you would go back into your medical record. You would check the, the entire encounter for all the different infusions, pushes, injections, and hydration that were given. You would determine what was the highest on the hierarchy, um, and then that would be your code that gets the initial um, for, for billing, and then everything else would be in each additional or subsequent um, and, and following after that. Here are some CBTs breaking down from the different services. So we have infusions, 
um, which are CPTs 96365 through 96367. There is also a CPT 96368, which we will cover here in a moment. Um, but yeah, this is an infusion. The, the 365 is for that initial, that, that first hour that has to be coded after that 16 minutes. Um, and then 96366 is for that each additional hour. Again, this is one that needs 31 minutes to be able to, to code for. And then 96367 is for additional sequential infusion of a new drug or substance up to one hour. So if a second drug is given, you would be using that code. For pushes, it goes for CPT 96374 to 96376. Uh, the 374 is for the initial. The 375, uh, it, this is for an additional IV push of a different drug than what the initial was. was. And then we have the 96376, which is for um, a same su substance. This is the one that you would need the half hour window to pass before you're able to use it. And then for injections, we have the two injection codes, 96372, which is for subcutaneous or intramuscular, and then the 96373, which was for intraarterial injections. So I did mention CPT 96368, that is for concurrent inf infusions. Um, when additional infusions are provided at the same time through the same IV lines, but it's in two different bags, this is when you would use the concurrent code. Um, this is not a time-based code, uh, and it can only be reported once per day. So it's a little different from the rest of them. Um, the initial infusion, so if you did an infusion with the first bag, this would be coded as your 96365, assuming that it was the top of your hierarchy. Um, and then if a second bag was hung, that would then be able to use that 96368. Um, if the drugs do get mixed into one bag though, this would not be considered a concurrent infusion. Um, this would only be one infusion, so it would not get the concurrent code. If your documentation fully supports the use of a second IV site, uh, then it would be appropriate to append modifier 59 to your codes. It would actually be um, considered a, a separate hierarchy. It would start over and you would use the modifier 59. Um, this has to be with, if it's in the same encounter, and you would never use a modifier 59 to separate an initial and a subsequent code um, because they would still be from the same site. And an NCCI policy states that a separate reporting of a procedure designated as a separate procedure when it is performed at the same encounter as another procedure in an anatomically related area through the same skin incision, orifice, or surgical approach is not allowed. Um, so because that is still going through the same IV site, modifier 59 would not be appropriate. Hydration is definitely a one of the more complicated issues that come up when it comes to infusions. Um, a, a lot of facilities can see that there's a lot of revenue sitting there, um, but there are a lot of important rules and guidelines that you need to know if you're going to be billing for hydrations. Um, so we're going to really cover that here. Uh, the first CPT is 96360. This is for the initial hydration for 31 minutes to the first hour. And then the CPT 96361 for hydration each additional hour. Um, the hydration codes were developed to report specific therapeutic interventions undertaken when a patient presents with dehydration and volume loss requiring clinically necessary intravenous fluids. Um, it, it's important to know that some chemotherapy agents, they actually require hydration either pre or post administration. But if your hydration is an integral part of chemotherapy administration, it would not be billed separately. And again, as you see in the, the CPT code for 96360, you do have to have 31 minutes of that initial infusion to be able to code for the hydration or you would not be able to code for it. And following along with the lines of, of you know, the reason that you're doing this hydration, um, you cannot use these codes for the purpose of to keep open an IV line or a subsequent to a therapeutic infusion or for free flowing IV during chemotherapy. That purpose in the hydration is very essential. 
Um, and that necessity for that hydration really does need to be documented in the medical record. Um, that will protect you from audits and that will ensure accurate coding as well. Per Noridian Medicare, and again, I, I encourage you know to check your local Medicare coverage, but per Noridian, uh, documentation of the assessment should describe symptoms that are warranting hydration, such as those associated with dehydration, the inability to ingest fluids or clear clinical contraindication to oral intake, abnormal fluid loss, abnormal vital, vital signs, or abnormal laboratory studies such as an elevated BUN, creatine, glucose, or lactic acid. Um, it is, they do also note that nausea itself does not indicate fluid volume depletion, and, nor does it support the necessity of fluid repletion. Um, it, it is obviously definitely a, a symptom that is seen common with those, but it is not by itself an indicator that would support hydration. Other non-payable scenarios from Noridian Medicare, um, if it's used as maintenance for IV therapy, replacing normal sensible and insensible fluid losses, uh, when the purpose of the infusion is to accommodate a therapeutic IV piggyback through the same IV access to safely infuse the agent. If the fluid is used as a dilutant to mix the drug. If it's hydration that is integral to the performance of a surgical procedure um, to establish an initial and underlying IV flow. Um, routine administration of IV fluids, whether pre or post operative And then infusion of IV fluids with electrolytes for the purpose of treating an electrolyte deficiency. Um, these are all things that you would use hydration for, but they would not be considered billable um, because they don't meet that initial medical necessity that they're looking for. Documentation obviously is very important when it comes to these services. Um, your documentation for these services should include the following, a detailed physician order. Um, that physician order should include the medical condition that's making it necessary for the order. Um, that also goes for hydration. You need the medical necessity. Um, you should have the name of the drug, the dosage length, and the route of the administration, and the frequency of the administration in that order. Um, you should also have a medical administration record and nursing documentation supporting these. Time must be documented correctly in the medical record uh, to, to properly assign codes for these services. It is vital. And again, start and stop times really is the best practice um, if you're trying to make sure you're getting accurate coding. But you do at least have to have the time of the administration and the total infusion time. Um, it's just highly recommended that start and stop times you know, gets the job done best. This also applies to IV pushes. Um, it, it is common practice that if time is not properly documented that uh, things are recoded to IV pushes um, because they don't have the time criteria. But each encounter and drug is unique and has a different administration rule. Um, some drugs just are not billable as IV pushes. So even if you are just giving IV pushes, it still is best practice to document those start and stop times. On my last slide here, I have some of the resources. Um, so this will be included when the, the presentation is sent out. Some of the resources that I use in, in, in gathering this information, links to Noridian Medicare, Novitas, and even United Healthcare. Again, uh, checking with your local coverage is best and, and checking with your commercial payers. But I wanted it to have these available for those who want to dig a little bit deeper. There's some good information on chemotherapy, some good information on hydration as well. Um, I do hope that I was able to answer any questions that you were having about these services. But again, please feel free to send in your questions and we will do what we can. And I want to thank you all for um, attending today. I do really appreciate it. And thank you to Taylor and Molly. Um, they are rock stars here at HRG and we couldn't do this without them. So I will now be turning it back over to them so they can present to you the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Troy. That was a lot of really great information. As he mentioned, uh, if you guys have any additional questions, don't hesitate to send them out. Also, uh, when I send out the other resources this afternoon, feel free to reply if you guys have any further questions, and I'll definitely pass those on to Troy. But as usual, we'll, we will be sharing the webinar recording and slides in an email later this afternoon. Included that 
in that email is a link to a survey. We would so appreciate you letting us know what your thoughts are on these webinars. If you guys have ideas for topics, we're taking those very seriously and incorporating as many as we can. Additionally, in that survey, you can request a certificate of attendance to be sent to you. And upon that completion, you will be entered to win a $25 Amazon gift card. Next week, we'll have Megan Smith back again to talk to us about building a quality program, a better quality program through collaboration. So with that, thank you guys so much for attending with us today. And we look forward to being with you next week for another webinar Wednesday.